I um, received a lovely newsletter from a friend this morning in, in which he uh, wrote about all the verses he'd been reaching, reading about the ministry of encouragement uh, in the scriptures. And uh, one of them struck me, it was a very simple half a verse really, in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13, the writer just says, uh, encourage one another every day. And um, he was saying that we often spend so much time making critical comments, but it's a good thing at the end of each day to ask, did I actually encourage anybody today? Did I exercise the ministry of Barnabas, the son of encouragement, with anyone? Well, it's a great opportunity when we're meeting together like this to very deliberately pray each morning, Lord, please me to lead me to someone I can encourage today, maybe even someone I don't know. And at the end of the day, to ask ourselves, did I actually encourage anyone today? It, it leads to a huge sea change uh, in the way we, that we think and the way that we approach each day if we're focused on being Barnabases. Personally, if I could be like anybody in Scripture, I would want to be like Barnabas. I think what a great gift it is to be the son of encouragement or the daughter of encouragement. I covered that one even more than the evangelist, actually, because I meet so many discouraged uh, Christians. So take time to more deliberately encourage in the coming days. Now, last year, uh, the meeting took place on, uh, online, and um, I spoke on the first uh, in the first meeting of that conference and I tried to give a biblical and an historical justification for the centrality of proclamation or preaching in the history of the church since the time of Jesus. John Stott famously wrote in his book, I Believe in Preaching, that the phrase which is mentioned in all the four Gospels about Jesus says, and Jesus came preaching in all Gospels. And he says Jesus is revealed as paramountly an itinerant evangelist in the four Gospels. So how dare we say that we, were, we will downplay the role of the itinerant evangelist in the modern church just because some people don't want to listen or because they think it's out of vogue? Um, what we have to ask ourselves is, is an approach biblical and if it's biblical, we therefore do it whether there's no response or big response. Because discipleship involves following the method and the approach of the Lord Jesus himself. And you can see further articulation of this in the Acts of the Apostles. There are seven apostolic evangelistic sermons through Acts of the Apostles. So there uh, you find both the gossiping of the gospel, individuals sharing the gospel, Small group work, house to house, which is where we get the idea of small group work from. And um, actually some small group meetings took place in Philippi, uh, in households. Uh, Lydia's household believed, it says, in Acts 16. And then there, are, the, there is many instances of proclamation, or sometimes we call it preaching, in Acts as well. So those three approaches were so central in the New Testament that I would say they are not only biblical, they are transcultural and transhistorical, and we must do all three. And actually, in my experience, I don't know a strong student movement in the world that has grown unless they do all three. The best student movements, almost invariably, in the history of IFES, uh, are those evangelistically who practice uh, all those three approaches. Now, we're not saying in foyer that preaching or proclamation is the only approach or that we shouldn't do the others or that there's only one style of proclamation. This is a mistake many people feel. They feel it has to be like Billy Graham or Luis Palo. I hear many American staffs saying this actually, but there are creative ways in which the gospel was proclaimed, even in Acts, the Hall of Tyrannus, Paul's engagement at Mars Hill. It's not just simple crusade type preaching. That's not what we're talking about. So what we have to help one another do, to do in our movements is read the New Testament again to see actually how they do it. Read the words and the text. See the variety of approaches. So we do not condemn other Christians for using a wide variety of evangelistic approaches because the whole world needs to be reached by as many means as possible. 
and proclamation is one of them, but my contention is it's central. Now, I noticed this especially when I was traveling around Europe as European Secretary for 10 years in the 80s, and then as General Secretary for 16 years from 1991 to 2013. I think I visited IFES movements in 120 countries. And as I was traveling around, I was looking out for the weaknesses and the strengths of each movement. And um, one of the reasons why I wanted to give the rest of my life to trying to find and develop public proclaimers of the gospel is because I met so few all across IFES. Last, last week I had a Zoom call with uh, Christian leaders from the whole of Asia. There were 1,200 of them. And one of the speakers said, I don't know any gifted public evangelists or apologists in the whole of Asia. Now, I don't know if that's accurate, but in the student ministries, I saw very few Asians. I saw actually very few Africans. The most gifted was a guy called Callisto Odede, who was on staff, a brilliantly gifted staff worker. Only a few Latin Americans. Caleb Meza was a gifted one from Peru. Samuel Escobar was in the early years. Um, and actually, some of the most gifted eva public evangelists I'd seen were in Europe or heard about them. There was Hans Burki uh, after the Second World War, um, German-speaking Swiss, who did a lot of mission weeks across Germany and Switzerland and Austria in the 50s and 60s. He was followed, actually, some of you will know Jürgen Spies, but actually Jürgen was one of the people who inaugurated events weeks or mission weeks in Germany so that by the end of the last century, you really only saw these kind of weeks in, in, in Germany, partly because of Jürgen's leadership and uh, also uh, in the UK. So one of my concerns was that I was concerned that IFES movements were losing the plot when it came to the public proclamation of the gospel before the watching world. And when I read, as I studied European history in university, the writings of Adolf Harnack, a great German historian, I was stunned when he was asked, how did the early church grow? And he said, by two means. They outlived the pagans and they out-argued them. They won the debate in public, both about the superiority of the biblical worldview and they proclaimed the gospel in speaking to the issues of the day. And actually, you have to do both. You have to demonstrate in public that the biblical worldview, touching how we deal with a whole range of issues, science, the arts, education, uh, the nature of man, the nature of marriage, sexuality, that the biblical worldview for these issues is the best and the most satisfying, but also that the gospel needs to be clearly, penetratingly, passionately, convincingly, convictingly, proclaimed, even when people don't like to hear it. I always remember in the World Assembly in 1987, Ingolf Pedersen, one of your predecessors, Bo saying, we are not seeing, we didn't see any people converted last year in Denmark, Lindsay. It's quite, it's quite difficult and depressing there. But he said, it's my conviction, he said this to the whole World Assembly, that we nevertheless must proclaim the gospel even when students don't want to hear it in Denmark. And I was challenged by that because Denmark then was, and it probably still is, one of the toughest countries in Europe in which to publicly communicate the gospel. So th there were essentially four reasons why fo FOIA came into existence. The first is the sense that across IFES and in Europe, there was very little public proclamation of the gospel. And I felt that was wrong especially in the light of church history and scriptures, and we needed to recapture that ground. There wasn't an attempt to give the name FOIA or anything. It was just that we wanted to see the renewal of public proclamation of the gospel in our universities. That was the first thing. But um, subsequent to that, as I looked around, I realized IFS doesn't have all the best people, doesn't have all the best public communicators of the gospel. And we're so up against it in Europe, against secularism and the effects of the Enlightenment, we just have to work with anybody else who's gifted at publicly proclaiming the gospel. And we have to form teams. And we have, have to cut out the nonsense of excluding people just because they work with other agencies. If they are faithful and gifted 
at publicly communicating the gospel. And by my assessment, maybe 50% of the most able people were student workers, but the other 50% came from church groups or totally other groups. And that's why we very deliberately from the early stages decided that FOIA would include not only speakers from IFES movements, but others who were gifted in other contexts and join hands together against the huge challenge of communicating the gospel in a secularized cultural context. The third thing, however, we noticed at the very beginning, if we can just move on to um, uh, this point, is that there were no female public evangelists at all. And I want to say this now because the five people I'm going to mention in a few moments are all Anglo-Saxons, and that's because very few people elsewhere were actually doing it up until the 1990s. But uh, my wife did some research on women evangelists in the history of the church. When we were living in France, we used to visit some of the reformed churches in different cities in France, where they often had um, museums about the Huguenots in the 16th and 17th century. And what stunned us was the number of women's names which were mentioned in the churches in the 1600s as predicant. Now, in French, the word for preacher is predicant. But if you add an E on the end of the word, it is a woman. It's not a man. And we were stunned when we saw these very humble little museums in churches in different parts of France with many women's names with the word predicant at the end. Now, many of the men were imprisoned. It's true. But God seemed to raise up some very gifted women. Secondly, if you move on to the next century, um, there was John Wesley, who was surprised at the number of female evangelists that God raised up in his time. He was not in favor at first. He actually just asked some women if they shared their testimony. And there was a lot of resistance to it in the Anglican church. And he went to one of these churches uh, where the vicar was called uh, Fletcher, Fletcher of Maidley. Uh, and his wife had a wonderful testimony. Wesley asked her to share her testimony. She was very reluctant, but he said, just speak for a few minutes. She did, and somebody was converted. There was resistance to her speaking in public, but the word went out she was more gifted than her husband. So Wesley often asked her to speak, and the crowd started to grow. The Anglican leaders were opposed to her speaking in the church, so her husband, bless him, turned the barn in the garden into a preaching center, and she spoke from there. And many were, many were converted. Do you know what she wrote in her diaries? Because she was struggling with the whole thing of being involved in public ministry. She said, Lord, please don't allow me to be a delicate disciple. In other words, help me to be bold and courageous. Now, a friend of mine, a, 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 a lady I knew who was a student, was doing doctoral research on the women around Wesley. She came from a very traditional Presbyterian church and she came across in her research all these women speakers and she couldn't live with the tension. So she didn't complete the doctorate because it was opposed to what she was being taught in her local church context. Somebody eventually did write the research up. I've got the book at home. Um, but um, uh, I think Wesley, like um, Hudson Taylor said, some of my best men are women. I'm not sure how you take that one. But what is consistent there is that what is intriguing, this is not an argument for it, but quite commonly in the history of revivals in Europe, God seems to raise up women speakers as well. Now, I don't know why that is the case, but it certainly happened amongst the Huguenots. It certainly happened uh, amongst the French, uh, amongst the uh, women around Wesley. And thirdly, it happened in the, in the Hauger revival at the end of the 1800s uh, in Norway when uh, the revival was named after the, the leader, Hauger. Uh, but there were also many uh, gifted female speakers around him. Now, however you take that, that's an historical rather than a biblical argument, but it is intriguing that God raised up many women uh, in those revival contexts. Now, there have not been that many to be truthful in the history of student ministry, but my hope would be out of some of the female networks around that some of the women here are leading, that God will raise up a range of other female contributors. 
not separating men and women too much, because my own conviction is that we work best when we work in teams with married and single men and women together with a range of gifts. And I would just be a little bit cautious about separating the men and women too sharply because of different perspectives and different gifts to help one another. And um, I think one of the lessons we'll see from these five evangelists is the importance of working in teams rather than working individually. Anyway, that's some of the historical argument by way of background. And uh, is there a next, uh, uh, next slide? Just one of them here is Josephine Butler. She did the first ever what the British call lunch bar in Cambridge uh, in the 1870s, packed out. And um, many people uh, uh, made, uh, many um, traditionalists made fun of her, made jokes about her. But she said the reason that she was proclaiming Christ was that there stands on the page of history one marked exception, one male exception. So far as I know, only one who never made jokes about women speaking and so on, and that of Christ, and that's why I'm serving him and speaking of him. Remarkable woman, just being rediscovered um, in, amongst Anglican and other leadership. Now then, uh, those are, so those are three reasons why FOIA began to develop in the way that it did. Uh, first of all, the, the lack of models around the world. Um, uh, the second was uh, the fact that there were female evangelists um, in the past in history. The third was that we decided to open up the network because not all the most gifted people were serving or past student workers, but God raises people up wherever he wants to, and we felt it was best to cooperate with them. And um, the fourth uh, reason, the fourth development, was that about 10 years ago, I think it was, um, John Lennox was often coming to speak at our conferences, and we started doing mission weeks after our conferences. And one year, uh, John went to speak in Lausanne uh, in the university um, in partnership with the Christian student group there. And they were start I think there were 1,200 people uh, in the conference or the lecture hall where he spoke. The students had had a lot of difficulty in getting permission to have a room for John to speak in. And no university lectures had stood up for them in terms, of, um, in terms of pleading for a room until uh, John spoke. And after he talked, about five or six lecturers came up to him and said, uh, I'm a Christian too. And he said to one of them, where have you been? These students have been trying to find a room. The university authorities are blocking them. They needed some of you academics to stand up for them and stand with them. And then John came back to me and said, Lindsay, we have to do something in Europe to help the academics to have more courage to stand for the gospel and speak of it in the university context. We need a partnership between the students, the staff, and the academics. We need to develop a program for equipping academics, which is where Tim came in, and the whole network of the academics. And that's, he'll speak more about this in a couple of days' time. But that's why we've tried to meet together regularly, academics and evangelists, because we see that we need people within the university and those of us who are coming from outside to work in partnership to communicate the gospel. So how was FOIA shaped? It came from those four influences which helped it to develop to where it is today. But then when I move on to five models, as we looked, one of the reasons I wanted to see something like this develop is that um, I had seen in my own experience, first of all as a student, and then connecting with people uh, in um, IFES in Europe and beyond, there were five really outstanding evangelists. Actually, I'm not sure we have anybody as gifted as these five today. And they were dying off. The last of them was Michael Green. And I thought, felt what a tragedy would be if we lost all the lessons that could be learned from these five outstandingly gifted evangelists. I often think of it in terms of, if you think in football terms of the pre prima, Premier League or the Bundesliga, these five would have been at the top 
of the league, and many of us in my generation are either at the bottom of that league or in the second division. But we nevertheless have to try to develop a model and follow their example, as well as the biblical model of uh, Jesus and the apostles. So I just want to share a few distinctives that I, o I personally observed in knowing or working with all of these five individuals. I prefaced it with the comments about female evangelists because I didn't see any uh, in, uh, in this time. But there are certain lessons from each of them I wanted to share which may be useful to us today. The first was the very first chairman of IFES. He happened to be a Welshman like myself. And actually the word foyer uh, comes from uh, what he, he described preaching as logic on fire. That is giving reasons for believing in and following the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are his dates. Uh, I, I knew him because he often came and spoke at my church when I was a teenager. And then he came to speak in Oxford for the last time in a university when I happened to be the Christian Union uh, president. He was very kind to me and invited me to his home for various discussions. He was the greatest preacher I've ever heard, actually, not just because he was a Welshman, but it's partly because there was an emotional depth. It wasn't just logic, but the Celts are often rather emotional people. There was an emotional depth to his preaching as well. Let me highlight a few of the distinctive characteristics of his style. First of all, he could evoke a sense of wonder about the gospel. I remember talking with him in his home once and asking him, a friend was doing a master's degree research on what makes great preaching. And I asked him, what are the marks of great preaching? And he said three things. Great preaching demonstrates the gospel is true demonstrates the gospel is powerful and demonstrates the wonder of the gospel. He said what is often missing, especially amongst apologists, is the inability to communicate the wonder of the gospel. Because the apologists can even present a very dry message in just laying out these are the reasons for belief. But he said great preaching touches the depth of human beings and you can tell the difference when somebody has communicated the wonder of the gospel, either because people see it coming internally from inside that person, they're so gripped by it and captivated, you can't go away and say, oh, that was, that was um, uh, left me cold or it was useless. Often, when these people have preached and somebody speaks to them at the door, they don't just say, that was a nice message or that was clear. They say, that knocked me out of the ground that bowled me over, uh, that was tremendously moving. It t gives people a sense of wonder, which is often done through communicating the work of Christ clearly and in a winsome way. Sometimes it happens through use of illustrations. But whenever I'm speaking in an evangelist meeting, I always pray that God will help me to demonstrate the gospel is objectively trustworthy and is true but also that he will demonstrate it's powerful through people being converted. And thirdly, that he will help me communicate it's the most wonderful message in the history of the world. That comes, when, first of all, when you've internalized it and you really believe that yourself. It come across, comes across in the way you, you communicate uh, the message. Powerful is important because there's no greater power than seeing somebody raised from the dead spiritually. I always remember being op on Operation Mobilization and going to a community in uh, South Africa. It was a rather unusual community. I met a woman there who said she'd been raised from the dead. I don't know if it was accurate or not. I went back to the Logos ship and told my roommate, who was Irish, you'll never believe this, Joe. I just met somebody who'd been raised from the dead. And he turned to me and said, that's nothing, Lindsay. You have to... You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And I can assure you that's much more dead than that woman would have been. So it was a real miracle to, for God to raise you from the dead. And it disturbs me then when I meet Christians who say, I've never seen anything supernatural happen in my life. Every conversion is a supernatural event. Whatever you believe about signs and wonders and otherwise, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And the power of the gospel is seen paramountly in people being raised from the spiritual dead and brought alive in Christ. The second thing that Lloyd-Jones said is that um, gospel preaching should always touch, first of all, 
the person's mind, then their will, that's the call to repentance, then the conscience is troubled, and somebody says, what must I do to be saved, and in Acts chapter 2, and then the emotions, there was awe and there was wonder when people were converted. And we make a mistake if we only focus on the truth dimension and the evidence. We have to go further in classic biblical uh, proclamation to touch uh, the whole person. And again, Lloyd-Jones said to me, there are two main weaknesses in contemporary proclamation when he was preaching. He said, preachers either start with the mind and stop there, or they try to bypass the mind, go straight to the emotions. It leads to a spurious early response, and it's murder to get them around the second time. Because you haven't reached out to the whole person. Now, I'll let you work out that, but a model of that is actually uh, Peter's sermon in uh, Acts chapter 2. He does all those four. If you look at the response to Peter's sermon. The other thing was he contemporized the message by responding to rhetorical felt questions. Now, several people this evening have talked about relational, apo relational apologetics or existential questions. He was doing this in the 60s. Let me tell you typically what his style was, okay? He'd say in the newspapers and in films recently, I've noticed people are asking this question. He'd toss the question up in the air. For example, in the late 1960s, early 70s, I heard him preach on the search for the transcendent because it was the age of Aquarius, Hinduism was coming, Eastern mysticism was coming. So people were rejecting the God of the Bible, but they were showing their interest in the spiritual as they do today by saying, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. The search for the transcendent. He tossed the question up in the air and he'd say, uh, what does this mean in terms of what are people looking for? And he'd play with it for 10, 15 minutes. And you could sense looking around the hall, everybody's saying, that's me. I'm looking in that direction. Then he'd say, let me take you to a passage in the Bible that deals with this question. Now, most people who tried to copy his style missed that dimension where he played with a question first of all. Another time I saw it brilliantly where, was where he spoke on Mars Hill. And uh, he didn't quote, Ma Paul, of course, didn't quote one Bible verse there. He worked from the poets, Aratus and Epimenides, and he also looked at the piece of sculpture. And what Lloyd-Jones said was that um, modern man, uh, this was in the 70s, is searching for utopia, searching for perfection. And many people historically, he said, have tried to search for utopia. And he started with, he said, starting with Plato and Aristotle, uh, the, the, the Greek thinkers. And then he moved through history. And if you knew the historical stuff, you know who he's quoting, but he never, he didn't mention many names because he didn't want to make people feel that they were stupid because they didn't know them. But you knew he was quoting uh, Spinoza, uh, Locke, then on to Sartre, or he said some French, French writers say recently. So he didn't parade his knowledge, but he was tracing through history. In 15 minutes, he gave a history of Western philosophy in terms of its search for utopia, and including the United Nations, and then on to John F. Kennedy and so on. And then at the end, you could see all this build up. At the end, he said, it's been a great attempt, and it's failed. And suddenly, you, sent a f you felt a sense of pathos. And my wife was in this meeting with a Cypriot student who was studying Greek philosophy. And she was getting madder and madder all through the talk because he was cutting, cutting, cutting her way to presuppositions and her worldview, which is, off, which is what happened with Paul, of course, in Mars Hill. And then he said, there's been this search for utopia, and it's failed. Then he said, and this was a sermon on, um, he juxtaposed Acts 17 with Genesis 3. He said, people are searching to get back to the garden, and they failed. Let me tell you how to get there. Then he preached the gospel. It was amazing, because what he'd done was he cut through uh, the Western worldview over centuries that's building up, uh, which is manifest today in various ways. He had done a lot of reading and reflecting, just like Paul did in Mars Hill, and in the vacuum then he proclaimed uh, the gospel. So he often started with what we might call a relational apologetic question or a felt question, an existential issue.
contemporary issue from reading the newspapers or watching TV and so on, or reading books. And then he'd, he'd look at the issue, how it manifests itself in modern pop songs as well. And then he'd respond to it from a biblical perspective. It's very powerful and very moving, very persuasive. And I tell you what it does. It leaves believers, not just unbelievers, attracted. It leave, leaves believers thinking the biblical worldview is the best possible answer to these searches. It was really fantastic. Now, you can hear a lot of these sermons. They're free of charge on, um, a DV, on CD with uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones recording Trust, actually. Particularly look for the ones on Genesis 3. Um, almost a Chris, oh, I'm almost persuaded to be a Christian. Uh, Agrippa and um, Mars Hill. If you want to read a book about his style, Preachers and Preaching is his classic book. Let's move on to the second one. Um, well, you all know Michael Green, the grandfather of Foyer. Many of you will have his own pers your own perspective on him. And uh, part of the reason we started Foyer was because I wanted Michael to share some of the lessons from his long life with us before he went to heaven. And uh, thankfully, God gave us 10 years with him. Let's look at some of the key lessons from Michael's style. First of all, he modeled working in teams and he invested in younger evangelists. Many of you will know that. Let me tell you the first time I met Michael, I was a student in Oxford and every Saturday I used to preach uh, on, literally on an orange box in the center of the city, just with four friends. And um, we'd each take it in turns until our voice broke, broke. And as one voice was broken, the next, broken, the next guy got up pushed the first one out of the way until all five had preached. Then we went off and had a cup of coffee. It was very rough uh, and ready, not very sensitive, and it was basically a lot of shouting at people going by. I was playing a lot of rugby at the time, and I even saw the big guys I was playing with walking past like this. They were frightened that I was shouting so aggressively. Michael happened to turn up the first Saturday he had arrived in the church in Oxford, and he was just walking around the town like Paul did in Mars Hill, and he came and watched us in action. And after it was over, it was a great example of how an older brother can help younger believers. He didn't say, Lindsay, you're out of touch. You're just a rabble rouser shouting at these people are going past. That's not the best approach. He said to me, I remember it very well. I like what you're doing. Can I do it with you? And he said, do you think I could make a few suggestions? I said, what do you mean? He said, why don't you think of forming a crowd? There are five of you. Four can stand around, form a crowd so uh, people might be drawn in. And he said, have you ever thought of using a microphone? We didn't use them in Wales. We undiscovered them. We just shouted at people. And we thought that was evangelism. He said, use a microphone. You can speak a little bit more softly. And people can hear. And he said, have you got any musicians amongst you who can draw the crowd in like Andy does, with, like the Pied Piper with some music? He said, have you thought of interviewing somebody to share their testimony? And then he said, have you thought of free literature you can give away afterwards? Or we have a little cafe linked to the church afterwards. Uh, why don't I do this with you? And we'll bring anybody who is interested to have a free coffee in the cafe. And we dialogue further with them. It was a masterful example of an older brother not taking a younger one apart and saying, you really don't know what you're doing, do you? He came and did it with us and offered suggestions about how we could do it better. He loved himself working in teams. I was telling Andy earlier, we were once on one events week about five or six years ago, and he was sensitive too. He could get downcast. There was not some response. And uh, I think it was a day that Slavko, Andy, and Michael came a little late, and Michael turned to me and said, do you know, I always feel so much stronger when these guys turn up because I'm not alone. And there's a team I can rely on and trust. It's a wonderful thing when an older brother says that, isn't it? That's why we should never work in isolation on our own. Nobody's got it all on their own. You need a range of gifts. That's why you need male and female. You need some gifted personal workers. You need others who are good at answering the difficult questions. You need some who are very direct in their approach. There needs to be room for all of them. And the most mature evangelists will make space for a range of gifts in their entourage to work together, not insisting that their style is the only one or must be followed by everybody else. 
but working in tandem with others. He balanced, he was a brilliant personal worker, and some of you will have seen this, he balanced public proclamation with gossiping the gospel, and very skilled at leading people to Christ. He held his learning lightly. This is someone who uh, had two doctorates and um, had been a theological educator and a principal of a theological college. He rarely spoke about that, but he used typically simple contemporary language very few doctrinal statements or words from the scriptures that he didn't explain. So rather than talking about all men are sinners, he'd say, you know, we're in a messed up world. We've made a mess, aren't we? How can we get out of it? You know what he used to do when I was a student? He used to write out all his evangelistic sermons and he would give them to non-Christian students and ask them, could you read through this, please? I'm thinking of speaking on Sunday and tell me if there are words you don't understand. And uh, then I'll ask you if you can give me a better word. Sometimes people were converted as he was using that approach. But he, he, he reworked all his material, really worked carefully to try to find language which connected with people where they are. He was fearless in dialogue with unbelievers. I have to say on one occasion in his church in Oxford, on Sunday morning, where there typically, typically would be a thousand people sitting on the windowsills as well, he invited the liberal professor of theology in the university to a debate about the, the authorship of Luke Acts. And he allowed this professor to speak first. He spoke first trying to argue that Luke didn't write the Gospel of Luke, neither did he write the, the, the book of Acts. And then without using any notes, Michael took the argument a point apart in 10 statements. And he gave the guy a right of reply, and he had nothing to say. And there were people converted that day, as they saw when he said at the end, you see how trustworthy this doctor who wrote in the first century was about the life and times of Jesus? So read the words of Jesus yourself. And by the way, this week, we have some discussion groups meeting here on Wednesday night. There'll be 10 of them. Come along and join us. And people were converted as a consequence subsequently. He linked proclamation with follow-up. We heard from one of the reports how follow-up is a weakness. He was meticulous in inviting people to follow on events. He prayed expectantly. Michael often mentions this, that every time he preached, he expected people to be converted, even in a secularized context. And he finished well. Andy and I were speaking at a... Um, uh, 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 an events week in Dundee in Scotland uh, just um, a couple of two years ago the week that Michael died and uh, it was the first night in Dundee and I was due to get up and speak at 7.30 and my phone went at 7.15 actually I was reading the first chapter of Michael's book uh, Jesus for Skeptics to a girl at the book table uh, so I finished the conversation and I found out who it was it was Michael I phoned it back he said, Lindsay, uh, it's me. I'm, from, I'm speaking from the hospital bed. He said, listen, brother, I think I'm going to heaven tomorrow. He said, the doctors are operating on my heart. They told me there's a 10% chance of uh, survival. So I'm just phoning up uh, to say two things. Thank you for being a great friend. And pray for me in the last 24 hours. He said, I'm giving my books out from the bedside to the doctors and the nurses, telling them to follow the way of Jesus. Uh, that's, the, that's the best way. And he said, uh, I finished the task, I think. Will you please speak at my funeral on that? To say, I finished the task and encourage everybody who's there to complete the task too. Those are his last words to me. And I called Andy over to, so he could say something to Michael as well. He finished well. What a great example at 88 years of age. His key book, I think, there are many books actually. He's wrote some brilliant evangelistic books. I think Jesus for Skeptics is the best-selling or most often given away evangelistic book among students in Europe at the moment. But I think his great book is the book he wrote in relation to his doctorate, which is Evangelism in the Early Church, which combines his classical learning with his evangelistic heart. So you might want to read that. It's a long book, but it's great. Best book I've ever read on evangelism, by the way. Uh, we're on to number three. I'll move more quickly now. David Watson was the man who influenced Michael Green more than anybody else. They were students together. He respected David Watson, who was a totally different personality. He was a, an introvert, easily depressed. 
very fragile, could sometimes be fearful, but brilliant use of illustration. And um, he came from a charismatic background, and it was through David that Michael was introduced to some of the Im impact of the charismatic movement. He never spoke much about it, but it shaped and reshaped his thinking. A couple of things about him. He coined the phrase in his key book, I believe in evangelism, uh, teaching evangelism. Now, some people today say that um, people have, um, you can't just uh, preach the gospel, you have to start further back. He was saying that 40, 50 years ago. He said what we need to do is, is engage in what he called teaching evangelism, by which he meant you teach the biblical truth on an issue, like suffering, or the search for identity, or the search for, for um, the, uh, um, the supernatural, or whatever it is. You teach what the scriptures say on that, and then you apply it evangelistically. So it wasn't a straightforward, some people would say straightforward gospel challenge. He was always starting with a felt issue, teaching what the Bible says on that issue. It might have been the issue of sexuality, something like Stefan sometimes does, teaching a, what the scriptures say on something, and then applying it gently to show the reasonableness and the weight of what the scriptures teach and using it, angling it evangelistically. He organized that he argued, in, this was in the 1970s, he wrote a book in which he argued we are living in an increasingly word-resistant culture. Now, I hear many people say today, people can't listen to arguments, they're so focused on the screens. He was writing about it 45, 50 years ago. And he said, because we live in a, a word-resistant culture, we have to try to balance the verbal, the word, with the visual, including drama, uh, music, and subsequently uh, film. And so he developed a dramatic group who used sketches. They're still around uh, today. He started using testimonies, music. So commonly, I remember being at one meeting where he was speaking in our university, the year I was the CU president. There were a thousand people there, people sitting on the windowsills and so on. He spoke for 45 minutes, but we didn't know his 45 minutes because he broke it up into three segments. And he was speaking on people searching for an answer to the question of suffering. So he had a dramatic reading of the book of Job. And then he opened up the subject. And then he said, I, some people think Christians don't struggle with this. I want to share with you one Christian who does. And he wanted to interview someone from a local church who had cancer. And she spoke about how God was helping her in that situation. Then he moved on and, and unfolded the biblical answer. And then he said, I'm going to give people a respond, an opportunity to respond. But before I do so, we're going to have some music. So we have time for reflection. So he was breaking it all up. And you never guessed that he was speaking for 45 minutes because he was bringing in music and drama and testimony in a very creative way. Very few evangelists do that even today. And one of our aspirations in FOIA, which is why often we have one seminar on the arts from one perspective or another, is because we're trying to find a way of integrating the use of film, music, drama, illustration, testimony, and so on, alongside the proclaimed word, in such a way that these things feed the proclaimed word. They don't replace it, but they strengthen it. They don't supplant the proclaimed word, they supplement or add to its potency. In some ways, Schaefer did something similar. We'll come back to that in a moment. Great use of illustrations and quotations. And as I mentioned, emphasis on the supernatural power of the gospel. I remember Michael when he was in his 40s. And um, he was a very confident person at that time. Uh, he, there weren't many people he looked up to. This was the one guy he looked to. But the interesting thing was there were total polar opposites temperamentally. He respected David Watson for his ministry even though David was not just an introvert, but a depressive and softly spoken. I had never, coming from Wales, I only knew preachers who were fiery and passionate and big, powerful guys. This guy was small of stature, sensitive, easily depressed, and yet there was a potency. I never raised his voice when he spoke. 
And yet I remember listening, sitting at the back of the hall when this group of 1,000 were there. I'd never heard the guy before and thinking, this is unusually powerful. And uh, there was a way in which he had the Spirit of God specially upon him. Uh, I always read this book before going on an event week. There are three great evangelistic books he wrote. Of course, our context is different, but they are recordings of the eight consecutive evangelistic talks he gave at one particular time. In Search of God, I think, is the best. Um, he, wrote, he did another one called My God is Real, and the third one was Is Anyone There? And they all contain about, they contain seven or eight evangelistic talks that he gave all across the UK, North America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and in other locations. And they are models of how to communicate in this way. We need to hurry on. Next one, Francis Schaeffer. My wife worked in Labrie for a year before we were married, and she was profoundly influenced by Schaeffer, as I was when I visited Labrie quite a number of times for weekends, both before we were married and afterwards. I hope that you will invite um, Stefan to give a lecture because he knows Schaefer better and has much more experience of the Libri approach. I think it would be great to have an historical lecture on Schaefer next year, for example. Uh, and actually, I've just bought a hundred books on people's recollections of Schaefer, uh, which I'll bring to, we, or we'll bring to the conference next year for everybody to have. Some of the things my wife wrote this section because this, uh, there's so many things that she appreciated about Schaefer. Honest answers to honest questions treated people's questions seriously and never belittled the questioner. I always remember being in the chapel in Labrie in Switzerland. On a Saturday night, Schaefer came in and he just sat down like this on the table. And he didn't preach. He said, right, what's the first question? I was shocked. I'd never seen anybody like this. And then all these people started firing questions at him. And some of the questions to most people seemed stupid. In fact, some questions People in the audience just laughed at them. Schaefer never laughed at any of the questions. He treated this, the question as if it was the most serious and important he'd ever heard. He'd give a careful answer to the question. Then he'd say to the questioner, have I answered your question uh, to your satisfaction? Or would you like to come back to me? And what you felt was that here, someone who was very gifted was paying attention respectfully to the question of that individual. It was a wonderful model because sometimes public proclaimers can give the impression of belittling a questioner. And the other thing about Schaefer's uh, approach there in terms of treating questions uh, seriously is that um, he often pursued the questioner privately uh, afterwards. He showed often great compassion with those who were struggling. Anne remembers she was working in a home for people with disabilities uh, in Labrie, and walking down to the chapel one night with Schaefer, and he turned to her and said, how is so-and-so doing? It was a little girl who, whose speech was, was very uh, poor because she was so badly handicapped in that, in that, um, uh, at that stage. He remembered her by name, he was compassionate about her and concerned for her. And that's often not, that's not always evident with, with people who are gifted at speaking at large groups, showing tenderness and compassion. Very humble, he spoke of doing the Lord's work in the Lord's way. And he, he said famously, uh, the, the men or women that God will use always have humble hearts. And if I could say one warning this evening, what sometimes disturbs me is when you have some evangelists who are knocking other evangelists, and you can sense it's because they want to be in the top spot. Ultimately, God will set such people aside, and we really need to be careful about it. Michael Green himself said, avoid pride like the plague, and spend most of your time praising other people's ministry and not so much yourself. Let other people pick that up if they want to. But what is, true, what is true of all these five, actually, is they were amazingly humble people. They had much they could be proud about. They were all actually very able intellectually. They, you know, they were top students and graduates, but very humble. One of the things that, that's striking about Schaefer, read his books, is God gave him some great words or phrases, like his memorable phrase about the nature of men and women, 
we are glorious ruins. How do you explain the nature of men and women? Our capacity to do good things and our capacity to do evil things, we're glorious ruins. It's a brilliant, brilliant summary of the nature of men and women that we see. This capacity to show kindness, generosity, compassion, and at the same time, to be uh, beastly in the way that we treat one another. Another one was that the, the Bible gives us sufficient answers to our questions, but not exhaustive. We don't need exhaustive. We can't know everything about everything or everything about anything. But the Bible gives us sufficient in order to believe and the best answers. That was a brilliant phrase, I think. Another one was taking the roof off. When a, somebody is, as it were, in a house, you can't get in through the windows or the doors. They've locked everything. They've shut you out. How do you engage with them? You take the roof off their worldview by asking them questions. How did you come to that view? What are the implications and so on? And um, one or two current Labrie folks talk about this style as subversive evangelism, by which they mean asking questions which draw people out and expose the weakness of their worldview. Then he, he was a gifted evangelist, but also engaged with the whole of life. So he was prophetic in writing a book about the environment, pollution and de in the death of man in the late 60s. I mean, this was a prophet writing about Christianity and the visual arts when they were often despised in the church or certainly neglected and so on. And then he combined proclamation and community. This is a big thing for Ney, I know, in the work that she's doing. But he believed it was very impos important not just to answer qu honest questions with honest answers, but to live a, a life of faith in community so that people who came to these communities saw how different the gospel was. Many people in Wales where I came from, I remember reading an article by one who was critical of Schaefer, who just thought he was dealing with intellectual questions. He totally misunderstood him. Because what he hadn't seen was the life of community in Libri and the prayer life. In fact, Jerem Bars, one of the leaders in Libri at the time, said, there would never have been a Libri without Edith Schaefer. You cannot understand her husband without the wife. Incidentally, that's a lesson for some of us. Try and marry somebody who really buys into what we're doing. Whether, it, whether we're male or female, it accentuates and doubles the impact of the ministry. Because Schaefer got very depressed, even uh, close to a breakdown, when things didn't work out when they were first in uh, the Canton de Valais in Switzerland. It was Edith Schaefer, relentless praying for breakthroughs, which led to the Holy Spirit opening up opportunities. Read the Labrie story. It's a great story of God at work in a European context. But it started with failure. And that's a lesson for us, that some of us may start off and we may sense that we have failed miserably, which is how Schaefer felt. But he was married to a great spouse. You know, one of the other things I really re uh, appreciated about Labrie going there was that in those days, I don't know if they do it today, uh, Stefan, the first of the year was always a day of prayer and fasting. Looking back at the previous year, giving thanks for what God has done, looking forward to the new year, and laying it out before the Lord. What a great way for a family or a community to orientate themselves. Looking back, giving thanks, it's a new day. Let's look forward to the future and spend the day praying and fasting for God's blessing. And uh, these are some of his great books. Um, I like how should we then live. Many people think the God who is there is uh, amongst the most important. Stefan could probably comment on others if he speaks on this. I, I think he still has much to teach us uh, today. And the last one is the great John Stott. I was speaking in his church just five days ago. Uh, in my view, this was the great evangelical statesman globally in the last 60, 70 years. And just a few brief comments about John. Brilliant, clear, analytical mind. His father wanted him to be an ambassador to China or elsewhere. Uh, he gave it up to be involved in ministry. Incidentally, uh, he also gave up the possibility of marriage in an IFES evangelism conference. He was asked in Poland in 1994, have we ever been in love? He said yes, twice. But I, I sensed that God was leading me to have an international ministry. 
and they would be unfair on a wife. So I forsook marriage, uh, and I have lots of nephews and nieces and uh, children in the Lord, as it were. I'm not suggesting other people do that here, but that was his concern. Even though he was brilliant, with a double first, that's really tops, he was really meticulous in his preparation. And the lesson for us, some of us just live by the seat of our pants, just trying to uh, fly by. John Stott told me he wrote every sermon out word for word because he wanted every word to count. Very meticulous. Now, some people would find that inhibiting. I need freedom to use illustrations, and the Welsh Celtic mind is all over the place uh, in terms of its orientation. But he was very meticulous and careful. Whether you write your material out or not, the lesson to learn from John Stott is to treat the gospel seriously and the listener seriously by preparing meticulously and praying over the material. And he did that right to the end. I remember hearing him speak at 84 years of age when he, his memory was beginning to go. And here's a lesson for some of us when we were younger. He had a series of small strokes for the last 10 years of his life which affected his memory. So sometimes he could be in the middle of a talk and his memory would drift. He'd say, uh, it'll come back to me, just give me a moment. And he had all the material written out word by word. He just looked down at the notes from a lifetime of meticulous care and he picked up the argument from his material. And it actually extended his public ministry, I would say, by, by about eight to ten years. Um, he was a great statesman. Um, when I use the word statesman, this is an aspiration for all of us. In the global evangelical church, I'm afraid there are very few statesmen or stateswomen. My definition of a statesman or a stateswoman would be, first of all, they speak very little about themselves. When you talk with them, they're always talking about, have you heard so-and-so? Have you seen so-and-so's ministry? Isn't it wonderful? So that after 15, 20 minutes, you have to stop and say to them, excuse me, um, you've been telling me about these other people for 15, 20 minutes. Can you just tell me what you do? Because I didn't pick it up. I missed if you said anything about what your ministry is. That's because the focus is on advancing the cause of the gospel and affirming the ministry of other people. Those people are very, very rare. Beware and avoid it ourselves of obsessively focusing on my ministry. Whenever I come across a guy who's obsessively speaking about my ministry, I want to steer clear of him. What I want to see is people who say, my concern is the advance of the cause of Christ and the gospel. And isn't it great that there's five or ten other people in this country or this continent we can work with who share that same passion? Let me tell you who they are. Because some guys in some ministries, they never speak about other people at all. It's not a good sign, and usually those ministries crumble. Because when you hear them, they're only speaking about themselves or their own people. That's a real flashing amber signal. Whenever you're a speaker like that, you watch the fall's going to come. Because God will set aside those who are focused on themselves and their own ministry, even if it seems to be the ministry of the gospel. Christ-centered and humble. Let me tell you the sermon that Chris Wright preached at John Stott's Thanksgiving service. The text was, Moses was the greatest of men in the East and the humblest of men in the East. And then he said, and John Stott was like that. He's a very humble, self-effacing man. And he brought together an emphasis on reason and faith. I, he famously said in one of our conferences, we must not pander to people's intellectual curiosity. There's no substitute for faith, prayer, and dependence on God and the work of the Holy Spirit. But we ne must nevertheless give people reasons for believing. Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who leads men and women into all truth. And God has made us as reasoning human beings. Therefore, we present evidences in order for people to believe. Well, if you want to read his book, great book, I believe, in preaching. I read it again last year. And he gives the best justification I've ever seen for public proclamation. His 
I, I think he said his, he felt his most important book was The Cross of Christ. Uh, he actually wrote 51 books. And um, all of them in a cottage in West, 50 of them in a cottage in West Wales, actually. He used to set three months aside each year for writing uh, books. When my son started in student ministry, he said, any tips, Dad? I said, well, apart from reading the Bible and um, uh, developing a capacity to handle, a bottomless capacity to handle disappointment, which will come your way, um, John Stott wrote 51 books. If you read those, you won't go very far long, wrong. He was the clearest mind I, I ever heard. Lloyd-Jones had the edge as a preacher. Stott had the edge as an exegete or an explainer of the text of uh, scripture. I think Schaefer had the edge as, he might not have liked the term apologist, but somebody who was gifted at giving reasons for believing. Now you can see these are five giants from the last 50, 60 years. Our hope and aspiration in FOIA is that we learn lessons from the ministries of these folks. Some of those things are still around with some of their inheritors today, but we miss out hugely if we don't pick up the baton from what they've left us and determine with God's help to apply some of these lessons uh, in our public proclamation of the gospel in our generation. Let me pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for these wonderful models uh, across the pages of history and even in the last 50, 60 years. Thank you for some who lived before them and worked in other places. Hans Burke, Samuel Escobar, John Sung in China, amazing evangelist in the early years of IFES. Thank you for these models, but we lament the fact that there are so many, so few people who really believe in public proclamation and are giving time and energy to it. Oh, living God of heaven, please raise up men and women who are gifted at humbly communicating the truth claims of the gospel in such a way that people see it's powerful and beautiful or wonderful in our generation. We know that the culture stands against Anybody who speaks up in public and aspires to, uh, 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 to share authoritative messages. But be, we pray that you will endow us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if not us, us, that you would raise up others, that you would raise up an army of men and women working in partnership, single and married, from both sexes, who will together be able to reach as many people as possible through the winsome, captivating, powerful proclamation of the gospel uh, in an age when most people are really resistant. We deserve your judgment, but we cry out, for you, out to you for this generation that you would not judge but exercise mercy and revive and reform our church and our cultures again by the power of the gospel. And uh, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.